The question we're looking at today is, does God get mad? Does God get angry? We hear this stuff about the wrath of God. Even the blessed Paul talks in two or three occasions about the wrath of God. So does God get angry? That's what we're going to be talking about. My friend Alfred uh, Wilson asked his, um, told his grandson that uh, he was teaching at the same school as Blake at Western Hills High School, and uh, he, he, he wanted uh, uh, Wilson to look Blake up, and he did this week, and I just talked to Blake about the fact that they did uh, get together. Uh, Wilson told his grandfather that the first thing that uh, Blake asked is, uh, Alfred and I have been friends since junior college. That's over 60 years ago. So he's one of my longest and closest friends. Uh, Blake asked uh, Wilson, uh, is your grandfather as liberal as Max is? Well, I guess I am liberal in some ways. In fact, I know that I am. But you know, when it comes to the gospel, I'm actually not that liberal. I believe in Jesus Christ as Lord. I believe in his bodily resurrection. I believe he is a, a king of glory and Lord of our lives and uh, is at the heart and center of all things. It's just, I'm, so I'm not liberal in that sense when it comes to the gospel. And I'm, I'm not conservative either because if you say someone is conservative, that generally means that there are biblical inerrantists, and I, I really am not a biblical inerrantist because there is nothing that has ever been written that, especially something as big as the Bible with 66 different books written over a uh, 1,500-year period, uh, more or less, uh, that does not have differences of opinion in it. And the interesting thing is that our Lord did not always agree with things that were in other parts of the Scripture. We know that, and if you're a biblical inerrantist, you just have to average it all together, and, and Jesus gets lost because the things that he says that are different from what other people say is just mixed in with the, with the rest of it. And that's where you come up with the idea that God is a God of wrath. And I hope I show you in just a moment that this is not something that our Lord himself would have said, and it is not something that he did say. And I can understand why Paul said it, because the understanding throughout the Old Testament is that God gets quite angry with people. And some, some things from the Old faith before Jesus, uh, Paul did not let go of. Most people didn't let go of. But the teachings of our Lord are actually, actually new. The, the, you, you, you know, the, the problem with anger, now you may disagree with me on this, but the problem with anger is that when you're, when you're angry, you want to hurt somebody. Yes, I'm getting, a, I'm getting a nod here. You do want to hurt somebody. Even if it's somebody that you love, you, you want to at least get even with them. You want to somehow straighten them out. You, you want to make sure they see the error of their ways. And a lot of times we just get mad, and instead of telling somebody, you know, what you said really hurts me, we will simply get mad at them and let it fester and get madder and madder. None, none of that is good. I don't get mad very easily, uh, which is nice considering the business I'm in. Uh, angry preachers are not that easy to get along with. Uh, I have gotten mad in my life. I remember, I've told this story before years ago, uh, when I was uh, uh, back in college, I was heading back to the dorm uh, one day and I uh, heard a kind of a splash and something wet got all over me and I looked down and some two guys on a balcony had thrown a watermelon at me. They nearly hit me. I said, well, that was close enough, but they didn't think so. They threw another one, and this time they were in even better shot. 
And I was mad. I was mad. I, who am <laughs> slow to anger, I was mad. And I was going in and I was going to confront them. I planned to hurt them. I did. I was going to punch somebody. I was going to kick somebody. I was going to do something to somebody. Uh, when I went into the building, I headed up the stairs, and there were two guys who passed me. And when I got to the room where I thought they were, there was nobody there, which is probably best because there were two of them and there was one of me, but I was really angry at them. When we get angry, we want to hurt somebody. I think it's important for you and me to know that God at no time ever wants to hurt us. Well, you say God is angry at the sin. Well, sin is something that we do. You can't be angry at the sin without including the sinner. You know, Jesus actually had a thing about anger. He did. Let's turn for a moment to uh, the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew. And uh, let's look at what Jesus actually had to say about anger. You have heard that it was said by people long ago that you shall not murder, and anyone who murders will be subject to judgment. But I tell you that anyone who is angry with a brother or sister will be subject to judgment. Again, anyone who says to a brother or sister, Raka, which really means you fool, is answerable to the court. And anyone who says you, fo uh, you fool will be in danger of the fires of hell. Why? Because saying <laughs> that, that demeans the other person. It belittles their humanity. And anger does the same thing, whatever we say. It takes away their, it takes away the essence of who they are. And it, wouldn't it be wonderful if people knew that one thing about a family relationship is a family is where, is where you really don't want to get angry with other people because you don't want to hurt other people. I've talked to you about this woman before. She is the, um, she is the greatest theologian outside the pages of the Bible, Julian of Norwich. Let's see when she lived. She lived between 1342, we know when she was born, 1342. All right, even Keith does not remember that. No, it's before his time. And she died sometimes after 1416. We don't actually know when she died. There's no record of that. And at the age of 30, she had an experience, excuse me, by the way, I did not go to this great uniting conference. I just decided that at this particular time in my life, my knees could not go to Abilene. Well, anyway, Julian requested something that I'm, you're never going to hear me ask for. She said that she, she told God this. She said, uh, before I leave my 30th year, and she was 25 or 26 at the time when she prayed this, I think, she said, I want to experience the suffering of Christ upon the cross. Well, I don't think God's ever going to do that to any of us, but she did get sick when she was 30 years and six months old, exactly halfway through her 30th year. She became deathly ill. 
the priest came. She was an anchorite, which is kind of like a nun. I'm not sure what the job of an anchorite is or whether we still have anchorites around, but they were a position within the Catholic Church, which was the only church you had back then, except for the Eastern Church. So uh, she said she wanted to suffer, and she got deathly ill, and the priest came and gave her uh, last rites. And he held a cross in front of her eyes, and this is the last thing she may have seen with her eyes open, and suddenly the image of the Lord on the cross came to life for her, and then she was out of it. She was gone. She was in another world. And she had hours of encounter with Jesus Christ. Now, I know enough about religious experiences. And I know a lot more about religious experiences than most people know about religious experiences. And I know enough to know that the things that she says about God in her experiences, and she has what she calls 30 showings, 30 revelations. It's like answers to 30 different questions. It was an intimate relationship that she had with the Lord. And he was there before her from time to time. I don't know how often she was seeing him or how often not, but I do know that she was given these answers, and those answers hold true to what we know about God through near-death experiences, conversion experiences, all kinds of religious experiences that we are familiar with now. I mean, I, mean, I am here to tell you that she gave us an extraordinarily accurate picture of God and Jesus Christ based on experiences that others have had and also on the teachings of our Lord. And the things that she was shown did not always agree with what she called holy church. Now, what freedom did you have to disagree at that time with holy church, as she called it? <laughs> you, you had no freedom to disagree with holy church. If you tried to disagree with holy church, the Catholic church, the only church that anyone in England, that's where she was from, uh, was, was familiar with. If you, if you tr tried to disagree, you, you you might end up being burned at the stake. But anyway, she had great respect for Holy Church. She loved Holy Church. But yet she was confronted with some things that uh, were not what Holy Church had taught her, and she had to struggle with it. One of those things was salvation, because she was shown to her that all Christians, and all Christians meant Everybody at that time, because everyone would have been baptized. Everyone would have been part of the church. That, and so, so this, this would now include people who are not part of the church, that all, essentially, all people are ultimately saved. Now, this is also what I believe. I think it's what the Apostle Paul believed, that eventually, not, not necessarily the moment you leave this world. You don't necessarily, we don't all have a ticket to ride immediately. Well, I think all of us do, but the Baptists over there may not. Well, I'm joking. I hope you know I'm joking. But there, there are people who are going to face difficulties. But ultimately, uh, our, God is a seeker. And if God seeks you, God's going God's to find you. But that's one thing that she... Had to, had to struggle with because this seemed very clear to her. And this is not what she had been taught in the church. The other thing that was clear to her is that God was not angry, that God didn't get angry. I'm going to read you that section. I'm going to read it not from the book, but from my enlarged copy so that I will be able to see the words. Ah, yes, here they are. Uh, I, ju I just love this passage. It's quite extraordinary. 
she said, um, the judgment from God seemed to be everlasting love. And this kind and lovely judgment, which was shown throughout my precious revelations in which I saw him assigned to us no kind of blame. He assigned to us no kind of blame. In other words, God is not blaming us for anything. I'm going to ask you why. You can feel free to tell me. Why does God not hold our sins against us? He loves us. What? He is merciful. He what? <laughs> he, has, he has already taken those sins upon himself. As far as God is concerned, our sins do not count against us. You and I are the ones who, when we are before his goodness, we will see our sins and they will be crystal clear. Okay? And, but God has forgiven us. We stand forgiven. When God sees you, the only thing that God feels for you is not anger, not vengeance, but you answer it. What? Love. That's what God feels for us. And those who, through circumstance, have an experience in which they enter into God's presence, I've never heard anyone ever say that God was mad at them. It doesn't happen. Our Lord indicated that anger was a destructive emotion. You want to hurt somebody. In this world, it gets you in trouble. Back to what she was saying. She said, and though all of this was sweet and delectable, yet I... <laughs> She said, I could not be quite free from anxiety just by contemplating this because of what I had always been taught by Holy Church, which I had understood and of which I was always aware. And according to the judgment of Holy Church, it seemed to me that I had to acknowledge myself a sinner. Well, we will, in fact, ultimately acknowledge ourselves to be a sinner, but here's the rest of it. Acknowledge myself a sinner, and by the same judgment, I understood that sinners deserve blame and anger one day. And I could see no blame or anger in God. So what did she do to work this out with Holy Church? She said, well, there is a higher judgment, and that is God's judgment, and there is a lower judgment, and that's the church's judgment. And she says, I'm going to have to work out how I'm going to make these things work together. But she says, I have to believe in that higher judgment because I got that from the Lord Jesus Christ himself. God's not mad at us. I want to read you one more thing she said. I came across this last night, and for some reason when I read it, I just, uh, I just broke down in tears crying. Just, I, I, I cried uh, like a baby. No, I cried like an 81-year-old baby. That's what I did. <laughs> she said this. She said, God wants us to remember that he is with us continually. She says that God wants to be sought. He wants to be looked for. 
The Apostle Paul said our whole purpose in this world is to come into this world and, and to feel around and see if we can find God. And Paul said this is what people have been doing throughout all of the ages, but now God has sent his son into the world so that we can know what God is really like and we don't have to feel around anymore and hopefully find God because God is right here before us in Jesus Christ. She says God wants us to seek him. He wants to be sought. He wants to be waited for. And here is the line that got me. God wants to be trusted. Now, does that have an impact on you as it had on me like last night? God wants me. God wants you. God wants us to trust Him. And one reason we know we can trust Him, because God has no desire for us but love. You can trust a God who rather than see us die, will give himself for us on the cross. We may trust God with our lives. And the blessed Julian tells us, God wants to be trusted. Let us trust him. Join me in prayer. Oh, blessed Lord. We trust you, but how often that trust falters. We are before you now, Lord. We know that you are there and we know that you are loving us. And we are sorry when we have gone in ways that you would not have us go, and we are before you now, and we are sorry for those times when we have not remembered that you are there, and we are before you now, and Lord, help us to trust you in Jesus' name. Amen.